How y'all doing today? Good. How many of y'all went to the game last night? And you're dragging. Me too. So I'm feeling your pain. Just try to focus somewhat. Um, we're going to do some housekeeping things first. Okay, announcements. Of course, as you know, I'm not Elizabeth Liebschultz. I am Dr. Norris Scobie. I am the director of the Advising Center. And I also happen to teach in the College of Education. Now, how many of y'all remember me from orientation? Were you in orientation? Okay, cool. And I remember each and every one of you. Well, okay, maybe not, but uh, you'll get to know me very well. Uh, today, um, I plan to speak solely on resilience, but I've got some housekeeping things we need to talk about for advising. So, registration appointments. How many of you all have looked at your card mail and you've received that invitation to make your advising appointments? Has everybody done that? Good. If you have not responded to that yet, please do so. It's an awesome feature. Did you have a question? Oh, but you need advising? Well, have you already seen your advisor? Okay, so that will be lifted. What happens? Okay, the registrar puts that hole in your account. It forces you to go see an advisor before you can register. That's why we're trying to get you all in early, because early registration starts at the beginning of November. So right now there's a hole on your account. Once you see your advisor, that hole will be lifted. So that's what we do. So just making the appointment doesn't lift the hole. But be sure to get those appointments in. Because we've held that for you, it's pretty cool because this is the first time we've done it that way where you get an email and you just have to respond. You don't have to come in, you don't have to call. It's great, it's an awesome feature. Okay, review all your assignments and due dates and your syllabus, keep up with everything. And then SOSR applications are out. So if any of y'all are interested in being an SOSR, please look for those SOSR applications. Okay, now I'm going to talk about what is expected of you when you come to your advising appointment. Some of you have already been in. That's okay. Don't stress it. Just next time you come in, next semester, everybody will be coming back in again next semester. But for this semester, um, first, of course, you have to make your advising appointment. Come prepared. So I'm going to give you some tools that you can come to your advising appointment prepared. Don't come in and sit down and be like, okay, okay, tell me what to take. Tell me what to take next semester. That's not good planning, okay? Your advisor's going to fill out a program sheet for you. They're going to go over your degree audit with you, teach you how to read that. And they're also going to ask you to bring up your student planner. And if you haven't gotten into that, I'm going to show you where to access that. But I want you to start thinking down the road, what are you going to take next semester? I'm going to give you some suggestions for categories. Now, if you have AP, club credit, all of that, go and print out your unofficial transcript off of Ulink. Look at that. Then when you get into the student planner and you access the flight plan, which I'm going to talk a little bit about as well, then you can start to fill out that planner because I want you to strategically plan ahead, not just a semester, but down the road. Two years, four years, however long you're going to be here, be sure to plan that out. And it's not set in stone in your planner either. You can change that around. So if you don't get the class you wanted, then you can just switch it around. It's no big deal. But that is going to help you be marketable, believe it or not, when you go to the workforce because you're going to know how to plan ahead. This is just one of those extracurricular things where you can plan ahead. Look at your transcript, fill out your planner, ask your advisor for a copy of your degree audit or your advisement report. I think it's what they call it on the, on the um, web, but it is your degree audit. It will tell you exactly what you need in order to graduate, what requirements you've covered, what you need to graduate, and then learn how to plan for yourself. So eventually, I mean, this year you're kind of learning the ropes, learning how to go ahead and schedule your courses, learning how to place your, your degree requirements together. Be thinking about with those electives, not just, wow, what's the best time for me or my friends in this class or whatever, but what interests you? What would support your plans for a career or the things that you like to do? And you can ask your advisor those sorts of things. Tell them, this is what I like to do. You know, I like to be outside or I like to do this or I like to do that. What might help you in your degree program? So be thinking about those questions. Don't just come in and say, what do I take next semester? I mean, that's easy. Y'all can figure that out once you have your degree plan. You'll be able to figure that out real easy. So, so think of some meaningful questions to ask. OK, so in order to help you prepare for your advising appointment, I'm going to show you some online resources. 
You also have the course catalog, which is not the most exciting thing in the world, but you really should go in there and look at your course catalog. So that's the 15-16 catalog year. Each catalog is different. This one is yours. This is your contract with the university on what your requirements will be. Some of your friends, some of your siblings may have a different catalog year. That's fine. Their degree requirements may be different. So, so look at yours. Look at the general education requirements. Look at the college of business requirements. Now, I know you all remember this, but what's the GPA to be in good standing? 2.8. Oh, awesome. Schedule of courses. It's up and ready to go. It's already defaulting to spring 2016. So you can go ahead and start looking at those classes. You don't have to wait till you meet with your advisor. I'm going to give you some categories to look at. You'll have your unofficial transcript. Start putting that together. You don't have to wait for us. Because the schedule of courses, when they come out, they tend to come out a few years ahead. And if you're confused about, oh, what's going to be offered next semester, or what's going to be offered two years down the road, your flight plan will show you if those classes are offered summer, fall, or spring. That helps you too. And if you go back and you look at what was offered maybe last spring or last summer, because summer's not up yet, it's pretty much the same stuff every year. So just, just go and look at those things. And then, of course, your unofficial transcript. That is critical that you know how to print that out and that you learn how to read it. If you don't understand how to read it, ask your advisor. They can teach you how to read those things. And then that way, you don't have to stress about coming in to be able to register for the right courses because you'll be watching out for yourself. When I was an undergrad, um, things were a little different. I was in uh, College of Arts and Sciences. I was a communications undergrad. I was a counseling uh, master's and PhD, but I had a faculty advisor. And um, he, I knew the course requirements probably a little bit better than he did, especially with Gen Ed. So when I would come in and talk to him, all we would talk about was his research and what he thought I should do when I graduated, which was great. But I kept track of my own plan. Now, you all are lucky you have dedicated advisors to each one of your majors. They know the ins and outs of the plan, but you need to know your plan, your individual plan, because you're just going to look different than somebody else's, even in the same year. So just be aware of that because you're going to take care of you better than anybody else can. Okay, so some of these online resources I talked about, I was going to get on the internet and show you, but I'm afraid I'll, I'll screw up this recording, so um, I did some screenshots. So what you're going to do, you're going to go to Students and to Academics. And then after that, you're going to look for the ad Advising Undergraduate. That is the advising website for the whole university. And if you ever have any questions about how to find one of us, they have four students. They also have the advising centers, but you all know where we are. We're in the basement, right? Has anybody been down there yet to see where we live? Okay, a couple of you. We're in the basement. We're easy to find. There's a big plastic horse out there. We're right across from it. We're right across from the roadhouse, which has no stake, but it does have lovely, lovely study rooms in there. Okay, so you're going to hit under four students. Man, y'all are dragging. You're so quiet. Okay, flight plan. One of the things you're going to look at is the flight plan. It's going to show you how it works. I'm going to have somebody come in here and explain this on October 2nd, but right now I want you to get in there. And you're going to look for your in-flight toolkit. I, I know these little things are kind of dorky about in-flight and flight plan. That's just our marketing scheme. and It's, it's kind, of, kind of silly, but that's what we're using. Um, so in your in-flight toolkit, it tells you it has tutor tutorials that will pop up, student advisory report, that's what I call your degree audit. That will tell you what you've taken, what you need to take. Uh, what if, let's say you're an accounting major and you decide, man, this sucks, I don't want to do this anymore. I think I want to be a marketing major. Of course, accountants, you would never do that. But you can run a what if report and say, okay, I'm an accounting major now, this is what I've had. I want to be a marketing major. It will revise everything and show you what you would need how your classes you've taken so far plug in. You could even do it, let's say you decide, you know what, I'm going to be a theater arts major. I'm done with this. I'm going to act. I'm going to be on Broadway. Same thing. It will show you what you would need to do if it will delay you in your progress towards your degree. So the what if report is pretty cool. The course planner, that's what I'm talking about, your student planner. And I want you to get in there and learn how to use that student planner because it will keep you on track. That way it's right online. You can change it as much as you want to. Um, the advisor's just got some new, pretty, pretty diggity little tablets. So they're going to have you bring up your student planner. When you come in to meet with them, 
uh, so they can see that you're kind of on the right track. So they're going to expect you to show that to them. All right, so when you click on one of these, you'll get, you'll get this screen. You'll get a Vimeo, and it'll show you exactly, like a three-minute, well, oh my God, it's a 14-minute video. You might want to watch it in chunks. It's crazy. But how do you use your student planner? Uh, most of them are like two or three minutes. It's not really that hard. I, I, I'm not real sure why it's that long. Um, if you go under the flight plan itself, then it'll tell you what your flight plan and milestones are. So 2015-2016, that's your catalog year. If you started this year. So go under there and look at it. It has one for each and every major. And it spells it out for four years. Now some of you, it may take you five years. You may say, man, I, I don't want to take 15 hours a semester. It's going to take you six years. You can adjust that. Say you don't want to go to summer school. You don't want to take 15 hours a semester. So it's going to take a little bit longer. But they're all defaulted to four years. It will show you how many classes you would have to take each semester if you need to go during the summer to graduate in four years. I think most of the programs, you can go ahead as long as you take the um, 15 a semester, 15, 16, you can get out of here in four years without the summers. The one exception to that, usually CIS students, you're probably looking at a five-year flight plan. It's not impossible to do four years, but it might take you five, okay? It's just the way the courses are sequenced. But you can get in there and look, and you can figure out so you don't get a surprise. You can plan. I'm going to be here this long. So it's not a big shock. Now, I was on a five-year plan, but that wasn't because it, I couldn't do it in four years. It's because I had a whole lot of fun when I was in college. I worked a lot, and um, I was asked to sit out a semester. So it's okay. You can bounce back, and we're going to talk about resilience in a minute. All right, here's what you need to be thinking about. And again, with your transcript, if you have AP credit, then you'll know where those things plug in, because those are all posted now. They weren't posted during the summer. They're posted to your transcript now. And also on your degree audit, it'll show you where those went on your degree requirements. So English 101, 102. Most of you are in 101, so that means you'll take 102 next semester. If you're in 102 now, bang, you're done with English, unless you really want to take some other English classes for electives. Communication, speech. These are really hard to get into, as you know from the summer but you may have a better chance this semester to pre-register. So you've got a lot of choices. Com 111, that's just general communicate, you know, general speech. Your speeches can be about all kinds of stuff. 112, 115 is interpersonal communication. Now 112 is business and professional speaking, so your speeches will be focused specifically on business. Any of them are good though. 115 is interpersonal communication, so that's not actually speech. It's a smaller class. It's how you interact with one another. People like to try to default to that. I tell you, you're better off with a speech class because you're going to have to do presentations when you get to your upper division courses, so you're going to have to talk in front of people anyway. And I hated it. I, I avoided a speech class even though I was a comm major. Thought I'd never have to get up in front of people and then look what I'm doing today. Had no idea. Uh, political 111 uh, is your speech is focused on political discourse. So you're going to do political debates if you're really into that sort of thing. And then women and gender studies, again, your speeches will focus on uh, women and gender issues. So if you're interested in one of those, pick one of those. Math, Math 180. So you've got a better chance of getting in that next semester. Everybody has to take Math 180 unless you're econ. You have to take 205, sad face. Not really. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a tasty, dense tort. Remember that? Tasty calculus tort as opposed to the tasty calculus cake. So if you are in Math 111 this semester, you're not yet going to be ready for 180. You're going to have to take Math 112. Okay? And ask your advisor where you are in the sequencing. But if you're ready for the Math 180, get it. You're going to need it. You're better off not leaving it to the end. I have seniors do that every year. They say, Man, I don't want to take calculus. I'm going to leave it to the end. Especially you econ majors, you are messing yourself up royal if you wait till the end to take that class. Because guess what? You're going to have to have that content in order to do well in econ 301. And I see it over and over again. Students wait and it just messes them up. Same thing with the math 180. Get it as soon as you can because that content is going to be reflected in your upper division courses. So don't wait till the end. Natural sciences. How many hours of natural science total do you need? Seven. Oh, y'all are good. Okay, so two different science lecture courses in one lab in one of the two. So if you took biology this semester, 
take geosciences next semester. If you really dig science, you can do physics or chemistry. If you didn't have it in high school, I wouldn't do it to myself because it's not going to be any more fun in college. Art. That's the appreciation of art, appreciation of theater, appreciation of music. You can always take an arts course. Humanities, you're looking at literature, um, some of the other areas in the humanities. History 101 or 102, either one of those is fine if you haven't had that. And then a social behavioral course. And this is the one probably most of you all have a social behavioral course this semester. If not, those are the ones that everybody loves. They're like, they can pick all different kinds of things, you know, whether it's JA, psychology, sociology, whatever. You can pick a social behavioral course. So you need one arts, one humanities, one history, one social behavioral. So be thinking that that's the general education. What's really important are the business core courses. Camp 100, especially you CIS majors. If you, I know most of you did not get the CIS 100 course this, this term. Next semester, we are going to hold CIS 100 courses only for students in the business school. So pre-majors can't take it, so you've got a really good shot at getting your, your Camp 100. So this is one of the first things in your business core. Especially CIS, everybody's got to have it, but if you're CIS, you, you've got to get in that class. Um, again, I'm going back over to the math because that, that helps with your business core. Ethics, um, there's, three, there's four choices. 222 is a general ethics, and the reason that I have a, a star by it is because it also counts as a humanities course. So it would fulfill your ethics requirement. It would fulfill your humanities requirement. 225 is business ethics. 321 and 323 are medical ethics courses. You can take any one of those. So, if you're interested possibly in being a pre-med later on down the road, I've, I've seen people do that before, or if they're interested in public health, they also take those classes. Biz 275, Intro to Business Communication. That's another part of the core. You, may, you probably will wait until next year to take that next fall. Uh, Biz 201, Career Development, that's a one-hour course. Everybody has to take that. Again, probably your sophomore year. Accounting 201, 202, those are sequential, so 201 is first, 202 second. If you're in 201 this semester, go ahead and take your 202 next semester. Econ 201, 202, you can take those in either order, it doesn't matter, okay? Biz stats, you can take your business statistics course if, as long as you've got the proper ACT or as long as you've had your uh, at least Math 111. And then I've, I've repeated CIS 100 just because it's so important. Now the camp, you're in it now, so you can check that one off. It's done, provided you, you pass it, which everybody should. There's no, you got to try to fail this class, people, let me tell you. Now I've had people try really hard and they were really successful with failing the class, so, so don't, don't do that. I mean, there's no reason. Okay, any questions about the advising staff? No, you're like, man, I just want to get out of here and get some lunch and take a nap. Okay. So we're all clear on what we're going to do with our advising. We are not going to walk in and, and say, tell me what to take. I don't know what to do. So is everybody enjoying their semester so far? Any surprises? Everything's exactly the way you thought it was going to be. What was that? Come on, speak up. I'll come out there. I'll come out there. Come on, talk to me. You don't want to just hear me talk. I'm going to hear y'all talk too. It's a big class. What, what's different? Yeah. Right. So that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad it's easier. So, so you have good time management skills, I'm guessing. You're a really organized person. Yeah. Is that your personality type? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Now, some of you may not have that personality type. You may procrastinate, which I am a habitual procrastinator, I admit it. Um, I've had to learn not to do that. But if you're not organized, if you're not managing your time well, then it's not going to be as easy as you thought. Now, keep in mind, you're in your Gen A courses. So that's kind of a transition from the high school courses to your major level courses. So these are more general, giving you a foundation in the liberal arts, which is very, very important, even for business majors. They have to have a liberal arts foundation because a lot of the, the corporations now, yes, they want business degrees. Um, CIS in Silicon Valley, yes, they are hiring 
CIS majors and engineers, but they're also wanting people with a liberal arts background that can talk to the customers. So, that stuff is really important, even though you're thinking, why the hell am I sitting through music history? Why do I need this? It gives you a different understanding. It gives you a different background. Anybody else has some different experiences this semester? Something you either expected or didn't expect? They're like, no. It is exactly the way I dreamed it would always be. I was surprised um, when I started, and I'm thinking back a lot, it was a long time ago, it was 30 years ago when I was sitting there where you are now, but um, the free time was a bit of a shock, but trying to balance work and school, that was really hard, and I didn't have a choice, I had to work, uh, you know, if I wanted to eat and have a roof over my head, I had to work. So learning how to balance that and realizing that in order to do well in my classes, I was going to have to work harder. Um, and give up some of my free time. So I had time to reflect on that when I got suspended and uh, realized that, okay, I need, I need more study time. I can't cut back on work. What am I going to cut back on? So I had to cut back on things like, you know, going out, going to concerts, going to movies, stuff like that, so I could study. I was able to learn how to bounce back from that. And that has to do with resilience. Now, what do you think resilience is? Nobody knows what it means. Yes? The ability to bounce back from failure. You're exactly right. Go you. All right. Yes, it is the ability to bounce back. There are factors involved with it. Um, do you think you're born to be resilient? That if you're not resilient now, you're totally screwed and you'll never be resilient? How many of you think it's an, an innate ability, being resilient? You're born that way. How many of y'all think it's something that's learned? Okay, it's a little bit of both. Some people, well, you're not exactly born with it, but you have experiences that cause you to become more resilient. And yes, you can learn to be more resilient. That's why I'm talking about it today. Now, here, here's the catch 22 for people in this age group, okay? In order to do all the things that I'm going to talk about, to control your emotions, to bounce back from adversity, that relies on your frontal cortex, this gray matter up here. Guess what? That's not fully formed until you're about the age of 26. So if you're under 26, you've got some space here to fill up. Now the good thing, since you're in college, we're working that muscle. So where you are learning to be more resilient, you are forming that frontal cortex at a faster rate than somebody that isn't challenged. Whether it's through life experiences, whether it's through learning. So you're building some brain cells, believe it or not. You're growing your brain right now. Sit here. If you're paying attention, listen. All right. So there are seven factors that go into resilience. So it's not just bouncing back. There's different, different factors. And I want you to think. I want you to reflect on how well do I deal with these things. So emotional regulation. And this is one that's difficult. Uh, tends to be difficult for younger people. The ability to stay calm under pressure. And it's not just the ability to stay calm under pressure, but it's how you react to things, okay? These are habitual ways of thinking. How do you react to stress? How do you react to bad things that happen? And I, I like to tell stories. I'm going to tell you some stories. Uh, I use my daughter as an example a lot, and she would hate it if she knew this. And next year I'm going to have to chill it because she's going to be coming to college and she'll die if she knows I talk about her. But um, how many of y'all remember your first relationship? your first, you know, whatever, and, be, and breaking up, oh my God, was it not the most tragic thing ever? And we've been, I've been through this four times with her already, and it's killing me, but oh my God, it's the end of the world. I'm never going to find anybody else. Oh, I love this person so much, and they didn't love me. Emotional regulation. When you get older, or when you grow this, you won't react as strongly, okay? I'm, I'm promising you, you won't react as strongly. Remember in middle school, I love the middle school years, those are just fabulous. Um, everything was drama, drama, drama. It was the worst thing in the world. And sometimes we still find that now, like somebody that fails their first test, honor students. If you've never gotten anything less than an A, that first B, that first A minus is devastating. Oh my gosh, it's the worst thing. I will never bounce back from that. My graduate students, same thing. They're still in that 22 to 26 year age. 
A dreams. I had one. I had an A minus. You thought that the world had ended. That she rode me up one while and the other. You've ruined my 4 L. My life is over. I'll never get a job. I'm like, and you're kind of a drama queen, and you need to learn how to regulate your emotions. It is not the end of the world. You will learn from it. It'll make you stronger. Impulse control. So that's the ability to shut out distractions and urges, and to restrain your reactions. Can you think of an example of impulse control? An ability not to control those impulses. And we're, we're set up. We're set up to not resist this urge. What, what, is, a, what is an impulse control? Think of one. Yes? Getting food late at night. Getting food late at night, yes. Oh, yes, awesome. What's another impulse control? A failure to control your impulses. Did you, did you have one? Yeah. Sales. Oh man, I love a good sale. What's another one? Well, well, trying to resist the impulse to say somebody's having a party, or should I study? Well, I'm going to that party. That's what I did, and I found out no, I can't do that. I have to sit here and study instead, even though, or go on to class. You're here in class, so, so you resisted the impulse to go and hang out with the squirrels on campus. And don't get me in my little buggers, chew me up, look at this. Can't believe it, attack squirrels. Um, and sometimes I'll drift off, just stay with me, all right? One of the big impulse control ones that, that I'm guilty of, standing in line at the grocery store. They got all this candy, they got these stupid magazines, but I'm like, Oh, it look pretty good right now. I'm standing in this line. So I have to learn to control my impulses when I go to the store, especially Target. I love me some Target, and there's all kinds of cool things, but no, I cannot spend my money on those things. Budget, that's another thing. You know, how to spend your money. Impulse control is all about that. Causal analysis. This sounds fancy, but all it means is that your ability to accurately identify a problem. And this might sound easy, but it's really not. So a lot of times when we're trying to figure out what happened, we're not focusing on what really caused the problem. So for example, again, I failed a test. Oh, well, that's because the professor hates me. They're an idiot. They've got it out for me. They don't teach right. They don't know what they're doing. Well, that's not really the issue. Let's go back. Let's go, or, oh, man, I'm an idiot. I'm never going to do well on this. I failed this first test. It's, it's over. It's over. Game over. No, the real causal analysis, how much time did you study? How far ahead did you study? Did you cram the night before? And that's what, that's what I used to do. I used to cram the night before. I found out that there was no way to learn. You can only have your attention on something for so long, like 30-minute chunks. It's the way you learn. I teach a whole class on resilience, strengths, and learning styles. This is just one little piece of that. But you need to realize that if you're going to sit there and cram for two hours, guess what? You're not going to retain most of that. How much of that will you retain? What percentage do you think you retain? 25 to 10%. That is all you're retaining during that. So you need to cut that study time down into 20 or 30 minute chunks with no distractions. And that's hard. That's really hard. And my, my daughter found that out the hard way and she wouldn't listen to me. So I had somebody else talk to her about it, and then, oh my God, it was a revelation then. I didn't know what I was talking about, but this other person did. But free yourself from distractions. If, if you're a visual person, if you're sitting somewhere where there's a lot of visual stimuli, you're going to get distracted, and you're not going to retain that. Your subconscious is going to store all the other things that are going on, like if you're watching TV, watching TV, or watching a video, watching a movie, it's going to distract you. If you're an auditory person, you might think listening to music is not distracting you, but really it is, because really subconsciously you're focusing on that. Some people are just the opposite. They need that, that background hum. But figure out which way you can retain the most information in 30 minute chunks. Causal analysis. What's the real problem? So then we've got realistic optimism. Um, that's your belief that you can change for the better and that you control the direction of your life. This is where a lot of victims get caught. They get caught with this realistic optimism. They either think, I have no control, I'm a victim, everything is done to me. So when something happens to you, when something bad happens to you, you don't have to talk, you don't have to speak out on this, but 
What, what are your thought processes? What happens when something bad happens? And you're like, oh my God, this happened to me. I have no control over it. I can't change it. Or are you looking at this horrible thing happened. I can't control the thing that happened, but I can try to figure out how to do something else in the future. Recent event, well, not recent event. We just had a recent anniversary of an event. Can you think of a, a, a global event, or, or at least in our country, that happened that people had to have realistic optimism to bounce back? They couldn't control what had happened to them, but they could control how they reacted to it. Can you think of one? 9-11? Can you think of another one? Katrina. Katrina, 10 years, yeah. All, those, all of those natural disasters, the people that bounced back the best were the ones with a realistic optimism. I can't do anything about this, but I can change how I react to it. And now they're rebuilding. So that's important. Another one is self-advocacy. To have confidence in your abilities that's a hard one sometimes for a lot of people. Having confidence in your abilities, especially if something rattles that confidence. So think in terms of little wins. If something sets you back, don't sit there and let it just destroy your self-efficacy. Learn to fail forward. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But the concept of you've had a setback, it doesn't have to stay that way. You have the power to change it. Empathy. And some people... People lack this, but it's the ability to read other people's cues, their emotional and psychological states. So, being able to, you don't have to sympathize, but can you empathize? Can you put yourself in somebody else's shoes? Whether it's a faculty member, whether it's your, your family, a friend, somebody you don't even know. When you see somebody that thinks a certain way, and sometimes I have hard, there's hot button issues that, that hit us all, Politics and that kind of stuff, I don't tend to talk about it too much with my friends because it is a hot button. But you have to be able to, to empathize. Where is this other person coming from? What is their background and why do they think that way? Why do I think the way that I do? So a lot of this has to do with self-reflection, being honest with yourself. And I'm going to ask you all to do some of that in just a minute. The last one is reaching out, being able to ask for help. It doesn't make you weak. <laughs> I see him back there. Somebody better be reaching out right now. Buddy! Um, reach, being able to ask somebody for help when you need it. It doesn't make you weak to do that. It makes you stronger. Reaching out also deals with networking. So it's not just, oh, I need help doing this, I need a tutor, I need to see my advisor, but networking with other people. So when Adam got up here and, and spoke, I think it was that first class, he networked, he reached out. He got to know the faculty, he got to know advisors, administrators, he got to know other students and then started making connections all over the world. So that is definitely an ability to be resilient. Now here's what gets in your way of being resilient. And these are the seven thinking traps that we get caught in. So the first thing you need to do is be aware of these thinking traps, be aware of how you react on those uh, resilience factors and then understanding where you're coming from, why you think that way, why you react that way, and then learning to be flexible, learning to change that reaction. Keep in mind, these, these, are, these are habitual ways we react to stimuli, but we can change those. We can change our reaction to that. So knowledge is power, knowing what you can change, knowing what you can't change. What's something you can't change? Anything. You can't change it. Get over it. Oh, that's a good one. I wasn't even thinking about that, but yeah, you didn't get into it. There's not anything you can do about it. And you know what? Some people just won't let it go. They keep coming up, can I get in there? Can I get in there? Oh, man, and the rent raise, you know, you're mean, there's an open seat in there. There's reasons for that. I'm glad you brought that up. That's good. So if you can't get into a closed class, you need to be resilient. You need to bounce back. You need to change your plan. Some people like to plan everything out from birth to death. They're like, I'm going to get, you know, have a partner at this age. I'm going to get married at this age. I'm going to have this job. I'm going to have 2.5 kids, a dog, okay, whatever. And stuff doesn't happen that way. I mean, how many times have you planned a vacation and you had all these great ideas and then you get there and it's like, man, this really sucked. 
This is not what I expected. You know what happens? You're not being resilient. You're not bouncing back. Something doesn't go right, go another direction. Just let it go. But yeah, a closed class. What's something else that you can't control? What is it? The weather? Is that what she said? That's true. Weather, natural disasters, all of that stuff. You can't change it, but you can figure out how to deal with it. You get rained out. That happens a lot here. Snow. We're supposed to have another snowmageddon this winter. I don't know, but um, we shall see. We need to get over that. But what you can do to prepare for that, if you don't have the text alerts, get them. Because it's my favorite sound, my favorite text uh, notification at 5:30 in the morning. Because I know the provost is saying whether I gotta come to work or die. So, same thing for you. Whether or not class is canceled. So there are things we can't change. Now the thinking trap. Personalizing. Believing that every event that happens, that everything that happens is your, it focuses on you. That the world's been around you. Well, guess what? A lot of times something happens. It might happen to you, but it's not because of you. It's not your fault. It's not your responsibility. It's not, don't take, again, don't take it personally. So, didn't do well in the class, took it personally. Don't do that. It's just because you either didn't get the material, you need to ask for help, you need to get a tutor. Um, another thing that you may take personally, somebody's having a bad day. Uh, I see this all the time. Go to the store, cashier, she's having a bad day, she's being all crummy with me. I'm not going to get mad at her. I'm sitting there thinking, she isn't doing this just because of me. She's just having a bad day. It has nothing to do with who I am. Externalizing. Nothing is your fault. So this is kind of the opposite. Personalizing means that you're taking responsibility for everything. You feel like you're personally responsible. Externalizing means that you're not taking responsibility for anything. Nothing's my fault. Everything is done to me. And you know what that does? Makes you a victim. Don't be a victim. Don't externalize. Sit there. I, I'll tell you, two students, tell two students. One student, well, both students failed the test. All right? And I keep, y'all are going to fail. It's just a good example. Two students failed the test. One student rants and rails about the professor, about everything. Everything went wrong. The other student sits back, takes it personally. The professor doesn't like me. I'm like, dude, there's 130 of y'all in here. I, I'm not going to personally pick out somebody to, to ostracize or treat bad. It's not personal. But the other student said, man, I didn't do so great on this test. What can I do different in the future? What did I do this time? What do I need to change? Externalizing. So take responsibility, but not too much. It's, it's a balancing act. Okay, the next one we have, magnifying and minimizing. So you exaggerate the negative, you minimize the positive. I had a student came in, oh, he was really, really, really smart guy, but he wasn't doing that great. And um, I can't remember exactly what his major is. I want to say maybe it was accounting, perhaps. And, uh, or you can insert any, any of our majors, but I believe it was accounting. And he's like, man, I just... I just can't do it. He said, I've got to, he said, maybe it's I'm, I'm working too much, but i got to work. So we sat down and looked at, okay, what are your work hours? Well, that wasn't really it. So I started looking at his transcript. He said, I'm just not cut out for business school. I'm just not cut out for it. So we started talking about his classes, and I noticed that he took a bunch of physics classes and got A's in them. And I'm like, why are you taking all these physics classes? He said, because I enjoy it. It's fun. I said, so, you get A's in all your physics classes. You get D's in your accounting classes. Do you like the accounting classes? He said, no, I hate them. I said, ah. He said, you have high math scores, you have high science scores, but you're not doing well in accounting. Do you think maybe that's because this isn't the right major for you? He said, I didn't think of that. And I said, I'm thinking maybe you should be a physics major. He said, well, no, no, I talked it over with my family and they said, the only way I could get a job and make money was with accounting. I'm like, dude, physics, really? You don't think that you'll make money as a physicist? Give me a break. So once he finally got over that, that he wasn't in the right fit, because he was, he was maximizing the negative, minimizing the positive. He was a smart guy, but he was just thinking he wasn't good enough. Again, a self-efficacy issue. Once he realized that he could change his major to something that he liked, that he could do something with his life that he liked, it changed everything. And that's what I tell all my students. Be happy in what you're doing. 
So if you're not enjoying what you're doing in your classes, if you're not enjoying the experiences that you're having now, you need to change it up. You need to figure out what makes you happy. Because guess what? If you don't like what you're doing in your classes or in your life now, later on down the road when you go to get a job, do you want to do that every day? Do you want to live that way? So I try to get my students thinking in terms of everybody thinks degree, major job. Yeah, that's true. But how do you want to live your life? Not what you want to do. How do you want to live your life? What is important to you? What makes you happy? Yeah, everybody wants to make a ton of money. I would love to make a ton of money, but I don't. But I'm happy in what I'm doing. I've done other jobs that I made more money, but I hated it. I was miserable. It made me sick. I gained weight. I didn't want to get up every day. I got depressed. Then I found something I loved. I don't make as much money, but I love getting up every morning. I love coming to work every day. So that is the key to it. There's intrinsic values. A lot of times are more than the extrinsic values. So just keep that in mind. Do what makes you happy. Do what you enjoy, and you're going to have a great life. And it doesn't have to be along a prescribed line. You know, I, I talk to other parents. So what's your daughter, what is your daughter going to major in? First, she thought it was going to be fine arts because she's a really great artist. And now she's decided philosophy. And they're like, whoa, she's going to be living in your basement forever because those aren't two high-paying jobs. I'm like, but she's going to be happy. She'll be successful in whatever she does. She'll get a job. She'll be okay. But she'll enjoy what she's doing. That's the important thing. I want her to be happy. All right. So then we have overgeneralization. So you, you make your judgments um, about certain things, about yourselves, about others, without evidence. So how many times do we do that? How many times do we overgeneralize? You make a snap stereotypes are one example of that. But you make snap judgments without any evidence. So you need to go ahead, do some research, think about the way you react to things. Again, when you react to something, any event, think about how you think. That's what you have to do. Mind reading, this is the one I'm guilty of. And, um, and, and I hate to sound sexist, but I think females do this a whole lot more than guys do because <laughs> my husband hates this. I'll sit there and we'll be, ta we'll be talking or arguing about something. And in my mind, I think he's got all these complex thoughts going on, his, these reactions of why, you know, it's like, dude, what, what is wrong? Why are you mad at me? Or why are you, why are you angry? He's like, I'm not. I'm fine. And I'm like, no, he's not fine. What's going on? What happened here? And really, what it turns out, he's just tired. He, he wasn't thinking anything. He's just like, tired. Leave me alone. He's like, leave you alone. Oh, now you don't want me around you. He's like, no, I'm just tired. Come on. I mean, how many of y'all get into those discussions? with, you know, someone else that's like, I'm going to put what I'm thinking into your head, when really they may not be thinking anything at all. I'm hungry. I want a hamburger. How many of y'all think you do that to some extent, that mind reading thing? How many of y'all have been the victim of a mind reading? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I see all the guys' hands up, too, and that I've been the victim of a mind reading. Let's try not to do that. Let's try not to put things in other people's heads. We do it with our professors, too. Employers, you go to work. You know, I was like, oh, man, my boss thinks I'm an idiot. When they just might not be happy with your performance on this one thing. That's another story. That, that's where you get into the mind reading. Find out. Talk to people. Um, and then take them at their word. You know, if they say nothing's wrong, hey, don't, don't read more into it. Emotional reasoning. The emotional reasoning is assuming that your emotions are accurate indicators of a natural, of the nature of an event. So, again, and this one's really hard to overcome. Oh my gosh, there's like a, I'm having a reaction now. There's a big old bug flying there. Um, emotional reasoning. So, don't react with your emotions first. Stop, and it's really hard to do. So, you're going to have to do some, some, what's called thought stopping. So, if you're starting to have an emotional reaction to something that has happened, calm down, take some deep breaths, look at it. Are my emotions, really giving me a picture of what's going on. Am I overreacting to something? So just think about what's an overreaction that typically people have? What is an overreaction you may have? Yeah? When people cancel plans. When people cancel plans. Well, how do you feel about that? That's a pet peeve. That's a good way to put it. 
is a pet peeve. What are some other pet peeves that people have with this emotional reason you might react very emotionally to and you need to stop? Pet peeves. When people lie to you. Okay. That's a pet peeve. So instead of reacting emotionally, try to figure out, well, why are they lying to me? What's really going on there? What is really causing this? Do they not want to disappoint me? Is there an, are they embarrassed? Again, that goes back to the whole empathy thing, too. So you can see how these thinking traps tie back to the seven factors of resilience. So if you get caught in this trap, it's going to lower your resilience score on one of those seven factors. So yeah, so, so people lying to you. One of the things that I react pretty strongly to is like if my kiddo gets a bad grade, I, I lose it. I just lose it. And I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta calm down and figure out what's going on, on with her instead of just immediately reacting to, to if she gets a bad grade in something. Catastrophizing. This is the most common one, catastrophizing. That this is the worst possible thing that could ever, you make it much worse than it needs to be. This is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. I'm never going to bounce back. My world is over. Catastrophizing. And we all do that to some extent, some people more than others. I see it more in probably college students than, than anybody else. Um, how many of you all think you're, you, you catastrophize? You think the worst possible thing ever? Yes. I do it to some extent, too. I'll sit there, especially when it has to do with health. You know, if somebody calls, Oh my gosh, you know, my, my dog's coughing. Oh my God, they're gone. I'm going to have to take them to the bed. I'm going to have them put down. It's going to be devastated when it was nothing. You know, they ate a stick or something, you know. Um, call in the middle of the night. Get a call in the middle of the night. I'm already assuming that somebody died. Okay, great. It's a relative. Something's wrong. It's the middle of the night when it's a wrong number. So that, that's my triggers, and that's what you have to think of. What are my triggers on these things? What makes me respond the way I do? It has to have something to do with your past, but you can change it. So I have to stop myself quite often and think, okay, I'm stuck in a trap. What the? What just happened over there? Something fell? Okay. So I'm not catastrophizing. You know, I could have thought, oh my God, squirrels have broken in and they're going to chew the rest of my arm off. But no, something just fell. Y'all are thinking, man, this chick is weird. She is super weird. Just a little bit. It's okay. I'm competent. All right. What? You're tired? Mind reading. You're right. I'm mind reading. Oh, look at you. Give that girl an A. I like that. I am mind reading. What I want you to do, your question for the day, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you, um, is going to be, which one of these thinking traps is most common for you? So I'm going to give you a minute to write that down, and then we're going to do a little exercise. Okay, so that shouldn't have taken too long, it's just a word, but which one? But besides just writing that down so you can get your credit for the day, I mean really think about that. That's one thing that people don't tend to do. They don't tend to self-reflect. They don't think about these things. And some strategies for minimizing the thinking traps, first one is that you have to be aware. So understand there's a difference between thoughts and feelings. Okay, so are you rationally thinking about something, you have evidence, or are you just reacting emotionally? Think of that, and if it's an emotional reaction, then stop. Stop right there and start, start looking at that. Thinking stops, everybody has a different way of thinking. So there's something called emotional intelligence. Have any of y'all ever heard emotional intelligence? 
I might bring some of that with me for, for when I come back on October 2nd to talk a little more about advising. But emotional intelligence, you have an IQ, you also have an EQ. So there's different types that you fall into. You just kind of naturally fall that way because of your personality. But we'll talk some more about that. But just, just be aware of what experiences, what things make you react to other things. When I talk about strengths, people think, uh, with strengths, oh, I'm good at math. No, those are things that you learn, that you have an aptitude for. That is different than a strength. Strengths are inherent. You're born with that. You have a natural part of your personality. For example, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ratings on those. Usually I use Strengths Quest. But one of my top, actually my top strength, way above everything else, is competition. I'm an extremely competitive person. That's why when I started doing poorly in class or if I wasn't performing well at work, then I started thinking, well, I want to do better than everybody else. And that's what kept me going, is that I wanted to beat everybody else. Yes, when I was younger, I was an athlete. I don't look like it now, because it just happens. But um, I want to be competitive. Right now, one of my big goals is to, to, to lose this middle-aged weight. But when I try to work out on myself, it doesn't work. I have to be challenged. So my younger brother, he's way younger. He's 16 years younger than me. Um, he needs to lose weight too. So I said, dude, you and I are going to work out together because I want to beat him. I said, we're going to do a marathon so I can whoop your ass, okay? That's what I want to do. 16 years younger, I said, that's what he's like. He's like, oh, you're not going to beat me. I said, oh, yeah, I am, buddy. So he's big, big, huge dude. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to run you into the ground. So understanding what your inherent personality is, what motivates you, then that's what you have to capitalize on. Because guess what? Innate ability only gets you so far. And there's lots of studies on this. Uh, Carol Dweck, she did a study on students that have innate ability, huge IQs, huge ACT scores, versus students that maybe didn't have as high scores, but they were highly motivated. They would go out there, they would put in the hard work they needed to do. Guess what? The ones that had lower ability but higher motivation blew the doors off the people that had the high ability and the low motivation. So you can overcome obstacles. You just have to be willing to put in the work. You can do whatever you want to, whenever they say you can be anything you want to be. Yes, you can, but you have to be willing to put in the work. And sometimes this point in time isn't the right time for that. I mean, right now, most of us don't really know what, you know, most of you, I even change day to day. And what do you really want to do? What motivates you right now is going to be different than what motivates you in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. And that's okay. But you have to learn to be flexible. That's part of that resilience again, bouncing back, because you're going to change over time. Your situation's going to change over time. You're going to continually have to reinvent yourself, especially in the world of work. What do you all expect when you graduate and get a job? How many of you all think that's going to be the one job you have forever and ever and ever and ever? One job? I hate to tell you, buddy. I, I hope good luck with that, because the, the <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, maybe if you're on your own business, that, that could be what you're doing. But um, the latest statistics show, I mean, I'm an anomaly now. I've been in the same place for 30 years. But I've done different jobs, okay? I've learned to change over time. I've started off in student activities. I thought I was going to do that forever. And then I went to being a facilities manager. I was a stagehand, an advisor. I did certifications. And now I'm back to what I really love, and that's being in the advising. But I didn't grow up thinking, I want to grow up and be an advisor. Or I was sitting there when I was 18, you know what? I really want to be an advisor. I wasn't thinking that at all. Um, so you'll change over time. Right now I'm thinking, too, I'd really love to have a farm with goats and mamas. It's just my thing. Um, and you're thinking, I so weird. No, goats and mamas are cool. All right, alternates and evidence. So think of different alternatives and evidence to support that. So if something happens, step back as part of this critical thinking, what are some alternate ways I can get to where I want to be, that, that path? And again, when I get back to the, to the career, the research shows is that when you all graduate, well, a lot of the jobs you're going to go for don't even exist yet. So it's really hard to advise or counsel somebody about what you're going to do in the world of work when it doesn't even exist yet. Because that depends, again, on the economy, on what, what is going to be in demand at that time, on energy, on resources, on all different kinds of things that are going on in the world. 
with the failure of China, with the, chi with the Chinese um, economy dipping, that is going to have huge repercussions. Huge. And we don't even know the effects of that yet. They put so much money into infrastructure for a long time that they were building. There's tons of buildings all over China that are completely vacant. But they did that to spur job growth. Well, now they've plateaued on that. They can't just keep building and not filling those buildings up or keeping, keeping, uh, using up resources and not replenishing them. So they've topped out. So that's going to have repercussions and that's going to affect the jobs that you get. Another thing is, is that currently 30% of the workforce are freelancers, contract labor. They work for themselves. My husband's among those. Um, it, it, it can be scary because he worked for the same company for 25 years and then they decided they were going to go to solely contract labor. That freaked us out. 50 years old and you're thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? But he bounced back. He's an incredibly resilient dude. He uh, took stock of what he hated about his job. He hated cutting his hair. He, uh, he, he hated some of the other things about it and he decided, okay, I'm going to work for myself. I know what I'm doing. He went out there and marketed it himself. He uh, and was able to work into his dream job. But he had to be willing to go out there. It was really scary. No insurance, no benefits. We had to learn how to redo our taxes. We had to learn how to start saving those things that weren't already inherent with his job package. And we were able to overcome it. Um, but he did great. He went out on the road. He's, he's a lighting guy. He went out with HBO Sports. Um, he went out with a bunch of different bands, and then now he's back in town and, and he was able to get his dream job. But it was really, really scary for a while. But that's going to be the wave of the future. More and more of the jobs out there are going to be freelance, contract labor, so they're going to be project-based. So you may not work for one company. You may have to work for five different, on five different projects at one time. So you're going to have to learn to juggle that. Those skill sets you're going to need, besides the content you're learning in your major, how to market yourself, how to manage your time, how to bounce back from the unexpected, huge, how to be adaptable. So, how to juggle a lot of projects at one time. So that's what you're going to face, and I don't want to scare you or freak you out, but learning now, starting today, how can you market what you learned in the classroom? How can you market your experiences now for the future? So co-ops are important, even if they're not required. CIS, we make you all do it. The rest of you, we don't make you, but I highly encourage that. We've got a career fair coming up. I know y'all. I think y'all are required to go to that. You might say, I'm a freshman now. I don't, go, go. You, well, you get all kinds of cool free stuff anyway, you know, pens, markers, highlighters. But you get to start talking to employers and finding out what skill sets do you want. And most of them are going to say, oh, I want you to do really well in Econ 202. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, I want you to be really adaptable. I need you to be able to work in a team and by yourself. I need you to bounce back from unexpected things. I need you to have a plan B, a plan C. And it's just as good as your plan A. It's just different. So that's what they're going to be looking for. Again, evaluating your thought processes, um, assertiveness and negotiation. Um, being able to represent yourself well. So if I have a student that comes to me and they're trying to convince me of something, um, I'm like, okay, make an argument. Convince me. That's, persuasion is an amazing thing. That's probably one of my favorite classes as an undergrad, persuasion. How to build your case. So a lot of times if one of my employees comes to me, if they don't like the way we're doing something, I'm like, all right, convince me. Tell me a different way to do it. Tell me what the problem is. Just don't come and whine. Don't sit there, oh my gosh, it's not fair. No, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, okay, what, how can we do it better? Build your case, make a plan. That's what people want to hear. They don't want to hear whining and complaining. They want to hear, here's the problem, here's how I fix it. I do the same thing with my kid drives her nuts. Uh, I try this stuff out with her, it doesn't work with her. Somebody else talks to her, it's a fabulous idea, but no. But it's like, don't come whining to me. Tell me what the deal is and how to fix it. Convince me that I should do it this way. We're negotiating car stuff right now, which, oh, good Lord. But um, convince me why I should let you do this. Convince me why that's a better plan than what I had in mind. All right. So our final exercise. Zombie apocalypse. What is the worst thing 
that could possibly happen. If you're going to prepare for the zombie apocalypse, you're going to need to be resilient. Now, how many of y'all ever seen a zombie movie or TV show? Or you can imagine that. If you ever have it, you're like, oh, God, this is so stupid. No, really, really, really. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, if you go on their website, they have how to survive a zombie apocalypse. Can anybody guess why they went with that marketing scheme? Spit it out. Yes. It does. It gets them interested. What else with a zombie apocalypse? Yes. If you can survive that, you can survive anything else. Exactly. It exactly mimics natural disasters. So whether it is a hurricane, or if it's a volcano, or if it's an earthquake, if the power grid goes down, that's that's what I tell. That's what I tell people. When I said I will survive because I know how to make fire. Okay. And I can survive without my cell phone. I'm there. I know how to sharpen a stick. I know how to make fire. I'm on it, okay? I can have a weapon, I can make shelter, I can make fire, I know how to purify water. Those things I know how to do. I worry that if the power grid went down and people were out their devices, without their phones, they would flip out. That would be the first thing. What do you think the first thing that happens during apocalypse? Besides you're seeing some guy, oh my God, that dude is eating that other dude. I can't believe it, oh my Lord. What is the first thing that happens during a disaster? What's that? Looting. Looting. What, what goes on before that, though? What helps the looting? Power goes out. You lose those resources we're so used to. Power goes out. Water goes out. What's people's first reaction besides looting? That, that's one half of it. Half the, half the nation might go, Woo, I'm going to go on looting. This is just great. But what's the first natural reaction? Panic. Exactly. Panic. They panic. What's going to happen to those people that panic and don't calm down? They're gonna, that's right, they're going to get eaten. They're going to be a zombie too. They're not going to make it. How many of y'all seen that movie, The Purge, those Purge movies? Again, I know, they're, they're terrible. I, I, but again, panic, panic. To survive the purge, you can't panic. So what are some resilience factors that we've talked about today that, thinks, that you think can help you survive the zombie apocalypse? You're going to make it. Why? What do, you have, what, what do you have in you? What part of the resilience in you is going to help you survive the zombie apocalypse? What strength do you have? Are you going to curl on a ball and wait to get it? No. No. So what will you do once you calm down over the initial shock of what has happened to you? What are you going to do? What is your strength? I mean, mine's making fire and sharpening sticks, so I'm right there. What, what are you good at? What will you rely on? The Walking Dead as reference. The Walking Dead as reference. <laughs> That's right. If you haven't seen The Walking Dead, you're just out of luck. Zombie Land's another good one to tell you how to survive the zombie apocalypse. But what you're going to have to rely on are your wits. So, let's say you can't make fire and sharpen sticks. What should you do? Find somebody that can. That's right. So if you are personable, if you're charismatic, if you're good at talking to people, you need to go out there and find other people that can do the things you don't. That's why I'm a good manager, because I admit I'm not good at everything, but I'm great at finding people can, that can do the things that I don't. So again, surviving the zombie apocalypse, surviving college, same thing. Don't panic. Realize what you're good at, what you're not good at, and find people that can help you overcome your obstacles. So, if you're not good at studying by yourself, find other people that are. If you're not doing so well on something, see the smartest person in the class, go up and talk to them. Can I study with you? I need a tutor. I can't manage my time. Reach. Reach has great workshops. Probably my favorite one, I'll tell you, besides the time management, um, is the study skills. Because I didn't see that until I was in graduate school, but I wish I had, because it explains so much about what I was doing wrong. I was trying to study in a way that was different than what I naturally gravitated to. So I learned how to study in my way. Not every faculty member teaches the way that you learn, but you can learn to adapt the way you view them so that you can study, you can organize in a way that works for you better.
So again, being adaptable. So if you can survive the zombie apocalypse, you can survive college. You can survive life. Any other thoughts on, on this resilience thing? Do you all think this is help? I mean, I know you all talk, but do you, have you ever thought about that before? About how you bounce back? About how you react to things? Okay. Well, when you leave your day, when you're going on throughout life, throughout your day, things happen that you don't expect, you're stuck in traffic like I was, don't get the road rage. Sit there and think, how am I reacting to this? What can, I can't help the other idiots on the road, but I can help what I, how I react to it. So, all right, y'all, go get some food, go get some sleep.